Sheikh Yasser Qadi's interview with Mohammed Hijab will go down in history as one of the great turning points in the history of Islam. Muslim scholars and apologists have been spreading the myth of the perfect preservation of the Quran for decades, but Yasser Qadi finally admitted that there are holes in the narrative. That the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. Yasser Qadi's most important contribution to the downfall of Islam, however, wasn't simply in admitting that there are holes in the narrative. He also ended up exposing Islamic apologetics as a whole. Discussing the topic of Ahruf and Kirat, Yasser Qadi describes the process that Muslims go through when they try to reconcile their beliefs about the Quran with the reality of the Quran. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. So there are three stages. But the first stage that Yasser Qadi mentions is the beginning student of knowledge. There's a stage before that, the stage of ignorance. Most Muslims don't know anything about Ahruf and Kirat, so they don't even know that there's something to be confused about. They've been told that there's only one Quran, perfectly preserved from the time of Muhammad, without a single difference anywhere in any manuscript of the Quran. That's the stage of total ignorance. Explore the comments section of one of my videos about the Quran, and you'll see how common this stage truly is. But the beginning student of knowledge starts looking into the history of the Quran, and he finds out that the Quran was somehow revealed in seven different ways, and that there are different versions of the Quran even today, and that Uthman burned the earliest Quran manuscripts in order to cover up the differences. And how does the beginning student of knowledge react? When you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? What is this mess? Now, the reaction should be, wait a minute, I've been told all my life that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter, and now I find out that it was all a lie. I guess I can't trust the scholars and apologists who lied to me for all these years. But for some reason, that just isn't the reaction. Instead of recognizing that he's been lied to, the beginning student of knowledge goes to his scholars and apologists and asks them to explain the different ahruf and kirat and missing chapters and missing passages and textual variants. Notice, he goes to the same scholars and apologists who lied to him all his life. And what happens? When you go a little bit more you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out, and you don't fully comprehend. So before he began studying the evidence, the student of knowledge believed his scholars and apologists when they told him that there's only one Quran, not a single difference in any manuscript anywhere. When he finds out that they lied about that, he goes back to them anyway, and they tell him that the Ahruf are just different dialects, and that differences in the manuscripts today are just accents and other such nonsense. And he memorizes these responses and mindlessly regurgitates them. But what happens if he digs a bit deeper, Sheikh Yasser Qadi? When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. Things get very awkward and difficult. Why? Because he realizes that the responses he memorized from his scholars and apologists don't really work. Shocker! The people who lied to him about the perfect preservation of the Quran also lied to him about the Ahruf and Kirat and textual variants and so on. Now, recall the four stages. First, there's the ignorance stage, when you have no clue what the evidence is. You've only heard myths from your scholars and apologists. Second, there's the confusion stage, when you've been exposed to some of the evidence and you realize that you've been lied to. Third, there's the regurgitation stage, when you memorize and regurgitate what your lying scholars and apologists tell you. Fourth, there's the awkwardness stage, when you realize that you've been memorizing and regurgitating total nonsense. 
What's interesting is that these four stages describe all of Islamic apologetics. Ignorance, confusion, regurgitation, awkwardness. Let's consider a few examples. Muslims hear from Zakir Naik that the Quran is filled with miraculous scientific insights, scientific insights that couldn't possibly have come from Muhammad because they're only being confirmed today. Muslims believe what they hear because they've never bothered to investigate. This is the ignorance stage. But then these Muslims, freshly deceived, come to us and tell us about the scientific miracles in the Quran. And we point out that, according to the Quran, the sun sets in a muddy pool, and that stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons, and that semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs. In other words, we give them some knowledge. And what happens, Sheikh? You're like, what is all of this going on here? So the Muslims are confused. It's the confusion stage. Why does the Quran say all of these ridiculous things? So they go to their scholars and apologists, the same scholars and apologists who lied to them by claiming that the Quran is filled with miraculous scientific insights, and they ask these scholars and apologists to explain all of the incredibly stupid, scientifically false claims in the Quran. And these Muslim scholars and apologists give them answers. Well, when the Quran says that the sun sets in a muddy pool, it simply means that Someone saw the sun's reflection in a pool as he was watching the sun set. What do the Muslims do when they hear this? You learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. The problem is they regurgitate these answers at us. And we make them take a closer look at what the Quran says. And we take them through the hadiths that show that Muhammad himself believed that the sun sets in a muddy pool, and that stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons, and that semen forms between the backbone and the ribs. We block the miracle of reinterpretation. We take our Muslim friends for a deep dive. And what happens when we take them for a deep dive, Sheikh? When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. Ignorance, confusion, regurgitation, awkwardness. Muslim scholars and apologists tell Muslims that Muhammad was the greatest man who ever lived. He was sinless. He was perfect. He never did anything wrong in his entire life. What's the stage? Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance stage. Then our Muslim friends spout this nonsense to us, and we point out that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl, and that he married the wife of his own adopted son after causing the divorce by lusting after her, and that he had nine wives at one time when his own revelations only allowed four, and that he had sex with his slave girls, and that he tortured a man for money, and that he ordered his followers to execute people for making fun of him. How... Do our Muslim friends respond? I am so confused. Confusion stage. So they run to the same Muslim scholars and apologists who lied to them and told them that Muhammad was the greatest man who ever lived, and they ask these Muslim scholars and apologists to explain all of the disgustingly immoral things Muhammad did. And the scholars and apologists explain that Muhammad had to marry Aisha because he saw how smart she was, and that Muhammad had to take the wife of his own adopted son because he knew she'd be happier with him, and that Muhammad had to violate his own four-wife limit because he had to make some political alliances. What do our Muslim friends do? <laughs> the miracle of regurgitation. They regurgitate this nonsense. So we show them that these justifications are absolutely absurd, even according to their own sources. What follows? Awkward. <laughs> Pure awkwardness. Are you seeing how these four stages come up over and over again? Muslims are told that the Quran claims that the Bible has been corrupted. Ignorance stage. So we point out, that the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Bible, leaving our Muslim friends in the confusion stage. Then these Muslims run to their apologists, who lie to them about Surah 2, verse 79, and Surah 3, verse 78, and these Muslims start regurgitating. 
So we show these Muslims the context of these verses, and that there isn't a single verse in the Quran which, when correctly interpreted, says a single word of criticism about the Bible. And our Muslim friends are stuck, feeling awkward. These are the four stages of Islamic deception, exposed by Sheikh Yasser Qadi, who, ironically enough, uses them quite frequently. So the Caliph Uthman standardized the copies of the Quran, and therefore, from his time up until our time, there has never been two copies of the Quran that are different even in one letter or one word. Now think about this. The beginning student of knowledge is confused when he's first exposed to some degree of reality. So Muslim scholars and apologists have to lie to him in order to keep him from doubting his religion. But if he keeps digging, he realizes that the answers the scholars and apologists give don't really explain what they're supposed to explain. That's when things get very, very awkward. From an Islamic perspective, what's the best way to avoid the confusion and awkwardness that arise for the student of knowledge? The best way to avoid the confusion and awkwardness is to keep people in a state of ignorance. This is why Sheikh Yasser Qadi says that the Muslim population must never be exposed to the real discussion. And I don't think it is wise to bring it up in public. Why didn't I say it? Because it should not be said in public. I don't want to get into that issue. Okay, fine. Why do I not want to get to that issue? I don't even want to be explicit. It should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. It should never be brought up in public. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses, Yaqi. It's not wise. This is also why there are blasphemy laws in Muslim countries. And it's why, even in the West, Muslim groups are constantly trying to have people deplatformed for criticizing Muhammad and the Quran. If people never know the basic facts about Muhammad and the Quran, the lies continue unchecked. Two questions you can answer for me in the comments. One, how can Muslim scholars and apologists and leaders make it any clearer that their goal is to keep people in a state of ignorance? They're flat out saying it. Two, if Islam were the true religion, would its adherents need to rely on an endless campaign of silencing criticism and shutting down open discussion? Would the true religion need that? Let me know what you think.